very important part of our worship, just as we've uh, sung and prayed and, and given, all part of worship. But listening and submitting ourselves to the Scriptures is um, a very important part and, um, and it's a great opportunity to uh, just learn more from God's Word. Let's turn to the book of Mark. We're going to carry on there. Just a little story here today that we're going to look into and it's Mark chapter 2, verses 18 to 22. Okay, we're going to read those and we're going to sort of meander, meander through this text and, um, and see what the Lord would have us learn from it. Okay, Mark chapter 2. Verse 18, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting and they came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, While the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it the new from the old and a worse tear results. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is lost and the skins as well. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins okay for those who have been sort of tracking through us uh, through Mark uh, with us um, we could probably come to the conclusion at this stage that Jesus he certainly knew how to stir up trouble right and um, he didn't have to go far to find it as it were it seems to be one controversy after another as we've been looking at Mark First of all, we looked at the controversy over Jesus when he forgave the man's sin. And look at the hornet's nest, that's turned up in the same chapter in verse 7. Then there was the the controversy over over the company Jesus kept. He was eating with tax collectors and sinners. And once again, that was a, a, a a, a bit of a problem for some. And now here we have another controversy with Jesus ignoring this tradition of fasting. You know, this fasting had become such a, can we say, like a holy sacrament in Judaism that what it meant to Jews was that you keep this or else. In other words, it had become like a, like a sacred cow to Judaism. And I guess that's a saying that we pull from India with the Hindus. Who they, that'd be right, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's funny, that, isn't it? English, English saying, but it comes from India. But it's, it, this is what it had become. It had become a sacred cow to these folk, and, and, and you did not knock it. You did not knock it. And according to the, these people who were addressing Jesus or and his disciples, Jesus was doing exactly that. He was knocking the sacred cow, this fasting tradition. They were saying that Jesus and his disciples were not following to the letter of their law, a tradition that was like a, it was a religious sacramental ceremony. Now this very issue is an age-old problem, right? And believe it or not, still with us today. Because whenever people or wherever people observe sacraments, religious sacraments, what happens is there's a tendency of thinking that the sacraments in and of themselves are the means of gaining favour or blessing from God. That's the problem. That's the real issue. That's always the major problem. For instance, some people believe that baptism can save a soul. Our Roman Catholic friends observe seven different sacraments, believe it or not. They observe seven different sacraments that they believe can produce salvation. You keep them because they have the power and the grace within those sacraments to give you salvation. But we know that the Scripture teaches that God's blessing of salvation comes only through God's grace alone, through faith alone. Amen? That's what the Scripture teaches. 
But what was happening here was the head honchos of Judaism at this time, they soon pick up on Jesus and his disciples and accuse them of debunking this traditional sacramental um, tradition of fasting. And they were doing that, if you remember the context, just a few verses before, we see Jesus and his disciples partying up with tax collectors and sinners because Matthew had thrown a big celebration in honour of the Lord, remember? And um, so this is the context. And so these Jews, Pharisees, were going to get some mileage out of this. They were offended big time and they wanted some mileage out of this event because it's going to build up and they really want to point the finger at Jesus and accuse him of being an imposter, a fraud, and which they do later on, by the way, in chapter 3. They say that he is even a worker of the devil. That's where he gets his power from. That's where it heads up to. So that's where their heart was. They were certainly looking for faults and they get something out of this. How true it is, folks, though, would you think about this, that there's no person as hard to deal with as a religious person. You ever known that? Come across that? You give me a pagan who doesn't know anything about God any day to talk to. You know, you, you can throw this at him, that at him, and you can have a great time. But you get a religious person who's steeped in his tradition and steeped in his religious views, and they're as hard as nails. Those people who are gripped by religious tradition, ritual, legalism, if you dare question their pet little belief systems, you will expose them for who they really are. And they're often as mean as the devil himself. Actually, it never takes too long for those kind of people when you do dialogue with them. It never takes too long to see that true gospel, the true religion has never penetrated their heart and brought about salvation. You do not see anything of the love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness that should be evidenced in a person in a believer's life. You don't see that. Well, these are the kind of people that Jesus is facing in these verses that we just read. He was really pushing their hot button, so to speak, on this one. But the sad thing is, folks, as I was looking through this text, I was thinking, we can be tainted with the same stuff as well, right? We're not Jews. Okay, it may not be the tradition of fasting that we're hung up on. Maybe some of us should have. But even in our circles, even in our circles, um, legalistic tradition you know what it is? It's an ongoing killer to the unity and fellowship of the saints. People often show their legalistic tendencies when they own their man-made traditions and they live on them, the hills that they're going to die on, and when those are not adhered to by others, they get really upset. For example... Just to throw a few out there, and there's hundreds of others. I'm thinking about the unity and the fellowship of saints and how that uh, legalism or legalistic tradition or man-made traditions can be a killer to unity. For example, you know what? People leave churches if their traditional songs and music and instruments are not solely used. People leave churches because their traditional every Sunday communion service may be shifted or only held once a month. People leave churches because their traditional, their traditional, note the T-H-E-I-R, their traditional translation of the scripture is not used by the pastor or the majority of the church. So we are tainted by this stuff, but we can be, right? We can easily be. Well, here in our text, Jesus is caught up in the middle of another controversy and at this time, it was a a controversy of not observing religious traditions. And by the way, a religious tradition is not wrong in itself. Don't Don't get me wrong here. A religious tradition in itself is not wrong. 
But certainly in and of itself, that tradition does not make people right. I want you to understand that and be very clear on that. First of all, we're going to have a look at um, this section, under three points here. First one is Jesus received the rebuke. We see this in verse 18. Then we'll have a look at verses 19 to 20, and I've got headed up. Jesus gives a response. So first of all, Jesus receives a rebuke, then he gives a response, and then finally in verse 21 and 22, Jesus gives a revelation, or Jesus and his revelation. So first of all, Jesus received the rebuke. You know, this all started an argument that went something like this. John's disciples and the Pharisees' disciples, so how come your disciples are not fasting? That was a question. But it's a pretty simple quest, isn't it, when you think of it? It doesn't take a Philadelphian lawyer to work out what they're trying to know here. Um, But we do note something, that they use some ammunition in here that may surprise us. They talk about John's disciples. You note that? They talk about John's disciples. And... um, Actually, they they use him as an ally or John's disciples as an ally in their questioning rebuke to Jesus on this occasion. In fact, if you go back to Matthew's Gospel, John's disciples play a pretty big part in this actual controversy because Matthew chapter 9, where it's told there, the same story is told there, it's only recorded that it's John's disciples that come with this question, not the Pharisees, only John's disciples. And so John's disciples were... Pretty big in this, in this argument. And um, so here were the good guys, so to speak, right? Here were the good guys, because John, we're talking about John the Baptist, you all know that. Here were the good guys, the followers of John, being lumped in with these hypocritical Pharisees to bolster their accusative argument. We might ask, surely anybody who was a follower of John the Baptist would have come become a follower of Jesus, wouldn't they? After all, wasn't it John himself who was the, the great prophet who bridged the Old Testament with the New and who said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Wasn't it him who introduced Jesus to the world and speaking to, to Israel at that time? Wasn't John endeavouring to have everybody know that he himself as a mere man must decrease and Christ himself must increase? Wasn't this the guy? Absolutely it was. Didn't people then who followed John automatically follow Jesus? The answer, no. No. In fact, if you go back to verse chapter 1, verse 5, you will see what was happening here we will see that there was masses of people going out to John the Baptist. They were coming out of the cities and the villages and the towns and they were listening to John and believing what the prophet said and what he was speaking about was the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And he says, be ready for him. That was his message. Repent and be baptized. Believe in the message of God here that I'm telling you. And so masses of people did come out to him and believe and were baptized as we know. You see, these followers of John, they wanted to be ready for the Messiah. He was an effective preacher and these people would genuinely repent, they would be baptised and they would show their allegiance to John's message of the coming Messiah. Now all this is to say that the disciples of John did not necessarily shift their allegiance to Jesus the Messiah. Actually, I'm sure most of them didn't even know who he was. Since, remember, it was only on one day of the very many that John was preaching that Jesus appeared and was baptized and and, uh, John introduced him, etc. Only on one day. And so John was out there preaching month after month and days on end and people were coming out to him. And so not necessarily that they knew too much about the Lord Jesus. Matter of fact, if you go towards the end of the book of Acts, and this is a long, long time after the events of John the Baptist and what we have here in our text today, a long, long time. John, Acts chapter 19, you will there meet a group of disciples that Paul met and it says there they didn't even know Jesus Christ. And then... Paul was able to lead them and they were, they were baptized and they became followers of Jesus as re- Jesus was revealed to them. 
So this heavy, accusing rebuke, with all its ammunition that the Pharisees could gather by using the, the disciples of John, they form a question. Why do you not fast like we do? Let's have a look at the ritual here, the sacrament, by the way, this fasting thing. So the ritual is one of fasting. And as you may know, it was, it's a time of self-denial. Right? And what it does, it serves to focus one's mind and heart in an effort to grow spiritually. That was the idea of fasting. During a period of fasting, the flesh, the body is denied. And what happens is there, so that attention could be given to seek God. And so the one who is fasting might refrain from eating or from any other kind of of physical fulfillment during that period of time. So that's the idea of fasting. But the real truth behind what these guys were doing here in Jesus' time is based on only one fast in the entire Old Testament that was ever required. Only one. Okay? You see, according to Leviticus 16, verse 19 to uh, 31 there, it was required that Israel, on the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, that they fast. That's the only time in Scripture that it was required. In fact, this is what it says. You are to humble your soul or afflict your soul. And the word that is used there in the Hebrew is a word that is commonly used for restraining from eating. And so on the Day of Atonement, they were required as a nation of people to fast. However, there are many occasions in the Old Testament where people fasted voluntarily. And that was always connected with sorrowful, heartbreaking prayer. You read about this in numerous of the, numbers of the prophets. You don't have to go too fast. We've been going through some of the minor prophets. I'm sure you think already the time when they themselves fasted. You th- I think of another one, Esther. Remember Esther chapter 4 when Israel was going to be obliterated by the bad guy? And so there was, there, was, there was a fast. You read about that in Esther 4. Remember Daniel, he fasted and prayed on behalf of the people who were in exile. And so all through the years of the Old Testament, right up until the time of Jesus, people did voluntarily fast and pray, even as people do today. You see, Christian people fast as well. Christian people fast when they want to be much before the Lord about something to such a degree that that even eating loses its appeal in the special time where they want to seek the Lord and seek His face and seek His wisdom. But in Jewish history, you will find that voluntary fasts were all over the place. There were sometimes one-day voluntary fasts, there were three-day fasts, there were seven-day voluntary fasts, 21-day voluntary fasts, there were 40-day fasts. You read that in Exodus 34 and 1 Kings 19. You can read about all those voluntary fasts there. As a matter of fact, if you remember, this is what Jesus did. How long did he fast? 40 days. He was on a 40-day voluntary fast. But the Pharisees, The Pharisees in our text here, however, these guys had gone beyond the voluntary fasting and they had by this time designed a a twice-a-week fast. Evidently, from what we can gather, it was on a Monday and a Thursday. Imagine that. And where we get this from is, you you can uh, remember the uh, story of Luke 18. A Greek preached about a month or so back and uh, it's still ringing in my ears uh, about the, the, the Pharisee and the publican who pray, remember? And, um, and the Pharisee gets up and he prays, I thank you that I'm not like other men like this publican. I fast twice a week. Monday and Thursday job. You see, that was their prescription, folks. 
This twice a week fasting had been made into a holy sacrament and it was deemed necessary by them, by every God-fearing person, that if you did not engage in this fasting tradition, you were unspiritual and not worthy of God's blessing. As a matter of fact, you were out of the game. If you were not seen to be doing, you were deemed a sinner. They were in no they were really into external behaviour big time, these guys. The actual ceremony itself to them was the in all end all. Matter of fact, when you think about these guys, the the um the three major things that they did publicly, these religious Pharisees, the three major things that they did publicly was to one, give money to the poor, secondly, was to pray, and thirdly was to fast. It turned out to be nothing. Their religion turned out to be nothing but a public hypocritical show. They did everything they could to make sure that others knew that they were fasting, giving to the poor and praying. Imagine that. As they were going on to the place of prayer, they would purposely go late and walk along the street so that they wouldn't get there in time so that they would have to stop in the street and pray and look all sanctimonious before others. That's the sort of thing they did. Jesus in his sermon actually picks up on this, on the Sermon on the Mount. And um, he rebukes these hypocrites by saying this, they love to stand and pray in the synagogues in the street corners that they may be seen by men. Matthew 6. You see, the Pharisees believed that God would see their self-denial and bless them for their sacrifice. They wanted everyone to know what they were doing, but also regulated fasting in that they commanded everyone else to do it as well. That was the problem. That's the problem. And that's always what happens in legalism. It's all right for you and us as individuals to have these things, but as soon as we impose what we believe to be, to be uh, good for us, necessary for others, that's legalism, and that's where it goes wrong. And so now they come with that accusing question, that accusing rebuke. Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not? Let's have a look at the rebuke just for a little while. Once again, remember the context here. Jesus and his disciples were enjoying a party. Yeah, they were. A lot of people, a big house. Matthew was, he was, um, he was well resourced. He had the finances. Probably ripped so many people off that he was able to afford the, a huge house. And, um, and uh, well, and so he, he had the necessaries to throw a big party. And Jesus and his disciples were there enjoying now, it is possible that this very celebration, as I said before, was either on a Monday or a Thursday, and one of the Jewish fasting days. And this really upset the Pharisees and John's disciples. Wow, this Jesus didn't keep to their rules. He didn't walk to the beat of their drum. These men had already decided how good people were supposed to live. It was all cut and dried for them. But you know what? Jesus refused to allow himself to be pressed into their religious mold. I love that. I hate being pressed into molds. Some molds I should be pressed into, but you know, yeah. He refused to allow the dead rituals that these Pharisees were going through and foisting up as something that was god sent and spiritual. He refused these things to become the focus of his life and ministry. makes me wonder, actually, if God and His sovereignty and, and, and the Lord being totally in, in touch with that didn't design for that party to be on a Monday or Thursday. But before we go on, let me reiterate here just once more. There is nothing wrong with fasting or with some of the other little religious things people do, okay? And that we do. That you do that I may not do, or that I may do, and what you don't do. There's nothing wrong. As a matter of fact, many of these religious things, these, uh, these ceremonies, these religious rituals, or whatever we do, uh, many of them I would commend. 
Some believers practice praying the Lord's Prayer repeatedly. Some people just love and are refreshed by citing the Apostles' Creed. Some people celebrate Christmas, celebrate Easter, celebrate Reformation Day without fail. Many religiously hold family devotions and pray together as a family. You know, these can all be good and healthy, voluntary religious practices. They can even be instrumental and they, for our Christian growth in the Lord. And they can, they can be a, a great learning environment for the family to grow in the Lord together. And because of that, I commend many of them. So we need to be understanding and discerning on all this, okay? But the problem kicks in when our voluntary religious practices become mere lifeless routines. That's when the real trouble starts, folks. As Carl was mentioning before, when ritual begins to take our focus from God, whom we worship, then it is wrong, no matter what we do. Empty ritual is always the enemy of true godliness, by the way. Always is. Some rituals are evil to the core. Absolutely. Make no mistake on that. Some rituals are. Things like lighting candles for the dead or praying to the saints and praying to statues. That's heresy. We can get direct commands from Scripture about that sort of stuff. But even those traditions that we keep which are commanded by God, good traditions and things that we should be practicing all the time in our lives, like praying and singing and going to church and, and, and having communion and baptism and Bible reading. You know, even those ordinary things that we would say, we would say it's normal for the Christian to be involved in can also become nothing more than lifeless routines if the focus is on the ritual and not on the Lord. So how does Jesus respond to this rebuke? This brings our second point here. And um, we see this in verses 19 to 20. Jesus gives a response. And uh, he does that by giving an explanation in verse 19. And um, he begins talking to them about a wedding. Imagine that. You see, weddings in those days were nothing like they are today. You have to understand this to sort of uh, see what Jesus was talking about. You know, today, as soon as the wedding is over, the, the couple are off and um, they're off on their honeymoon, right? That's pretty normal. But in Jesus' day, it was very different. Just track with me on this. You see, what happened is, as soon as the wedding was over in Jesus' day, and actually some parts of the Middle East, are, they still hang on to a little bit of this tradition. As soon as the wedding was over, what happens is the newlyweds host a family and friends week of celebration. So in other words, what they did, they got married, but immediately seven days of partying and being treated like a king and queen, the bride and bridegroom would enjoy for seven days. Imagine that. I think I'd like that. Treat her like king and queen for a week. Maybe not. Fasting was out. Fasting was out. Matter of fact, you drop an E into the word fasting and we know what you get. You get the word feasting. Feasting takes over. And that's what you did. You didn't go without. You celebrated. You rejoiced. You partied. Whatever word you want to put on there. You enjoyed. Jesus emphasized this in, this in that verse. Twice he says, you cannot fast. You cannot fast. Jesus tells his critics that his presence among his people is like that of a bridegroom among his friends. It is not a time for mourning, self-denial and sadness. It is not a time for going hungry and going without. But it's a time for celebration, gladness and joy. 
be sad to mourn, to fast while the Lord was present would be out of character with what the Lord was doing in those days, right? Totally out of character. Now, there's a practical lesson in these verses here for us, folks. I want to just draw your attention to it. The Jews were so caught up in their rituals and in their traditions they couldn't see the wood for the trees. Had they known, had their sin-blinded eyes been opened so that they could see Jesus for who he was, you know what that would have happened? They would have ceased their fasting and they would have joined in on the feasting. They would have been in that house and they would have packed it out with those tax collectors and sinners as well. Now, sometimes we're guilty of the same things, folks. We do the church thing, right? We do the church thing out of habit sometimes. And we fail to recognize that as God we come to meet. You see, appreciating and living in the reality of being in the presence of a holy and a righteous God every moment of our lives. You know, if we lived in that reality and really believed that I believe it would transform every moment of our lives. We would cease our whinging about this and that and whatever else and we would live and learn to live life abundantly no matter what the circumstances. We would walk in joy and celebrate with our lives God's amazing grace and His abundant blessing. You see, when the Lord is present, folks, His people are to acknowledge Him with joy and singing and celebration, right? Ecclesiastes chapter 3 really carries this whole concept through. Um, Verse 4, there's a time to weep, sure, and there's a time to laugh, but there's also a time to mourn and a time to dance. And now is not the time for our mourning. Now is not the time for our focus to be on anything else but the Lord because He's risen, He's glorified, He's coming again, He's he's with us, His Spirit abides with us. So we are in a day of celebration. I love when we have the Lord's Supper. Yes, we look at the cost and we mourn, but soon those, that, that mourning is, is whipped away because the Lord has risen, amen, and we rejoice. And that's how it should be. Gone would be empty hearts, empty rituals and empty sacraments if we lived in the reality of that. We'll be bubbling over with ways of expressing our joy in who the Lord is and what He's done for us. We would be. We would see a change in our church. We would be wanting to come together more than we want now. I would be wanting to come together more than I want now. I would be bubbling over more than I am bubbling over and often are not. We would become to worship the Lord together as we ought. Verse 20 tells us of an expectation here. You see, Jesus not only explains with a wedding celebration, but he also warns them of what it, of, uh, to expect to come. Because something, something was going to happen next. You see, there will be a time for mourning and sadness and going without. The phrase shall be taken away. What it speaks of here is, is a sudden removal. Jesus is referring to the time when he will be, will be taken away, that he will be crucified, nailed to the cross. In other words, saying there is a time when your Messiah will be snatched away. Isaiah said the same thing in chapter 53, verse 8. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away, it says. He was cut off out of the land of the living. That means he was killed for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. Isaiah records that. And he will be taken away. He will be killed in our place, was what Jesus was saying here at this time. 
in that dark and dreadful day, his followers, yes, they will mourn and fast. That will be a day of sadness for his people. That day will come, the Lord says. But now, but now, Jesus was saying to these folk, the disciples of the Lord were right to be excited and joyful in his presence because Jesus was with them. Dear people, because we are the bride of Christ who is now risen and glorified and his spirit abides with us always, how much more truthful and does it ring in our hearts when the Apostle Paul exhorts the Philippian believers, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Shouldn't that be what we are? Amen. Okay, and thirdly, we see Jesus and his revelation, or Jesus gives a revelation in verses 21 and 22. And um, what Jesus wants to do here is to make his point crystal clear. Crystal clear, right? Just so you don't get it wrong. He rocks in with this, uh, this very clear illustration. And he uses two vivid illustrations from everyday life. He wants the Jews to understand that he did not come to preach a new and improved Judaism. He wants them to know that he did not come to re-upholster or to patch up and improve Judaism. He wants them to know that he has come to do away with the old and bring in something brand spanking and entirely new. That's what he wanted them to know. He wanted them to know that their religion and their rituals and their rules have absolutely no place in what he is accomplishing. Jesus wants these people to know that he was that what he was doing and what they were doing were so different and poles apart that they could never ever be connected. That's what he was saying here. He wants them to get the message that his gospel, listen to this, that his gospel cannot be contained within the confines of their works-based religion. You see, Jesus didn't come to refurbish Judaism. He came to establish Christianity. He confronts them with this clear, dogmatic, and what we might call today culturally insensitive, politically incorrect statement. And he says something like this, just as you never patch up an old shrunken garment with a brand new piece of unshrunken material, and just as you never put new wine into old crack and used wineskins, you cannot synchronize or adjust ritualistic external religion to accommodate the gospel. That's what he says. The two just do not and never will mix. They are incompatible. The Christian gospel stands alone, folks. It stands alone as the only way of salvation and it's incompatible with every other religious system. You hear that? You might think, oh, you're getting a bit dogmatic. Can't help it. This is what the Lord says here. The gospel comes by grace through faith and nothing else. And that's a hill that I and you as believers must be prepared to die on. We cannot afford to put our arms out and embrace other religions thinking that God will smile upon us and accommodate their belief system with the true gospel. It doesn't work, folks. It won't work. So what do we learn from this? No matter what you feel, you get that? No matter what you feel, even right now, or what you've been taught in the past, know this. Do not think that God will accommodate blended Christianity where people have ignorantly added Jesus to their religion or belief system. I think Benji has told me a couple of times, um, and I'm not being um, derogatory against individuals, but I'm speaking about a system, okay? There's a difference between speaking about people who believe in a system and speaking about a system. When I talk about Catholicism, I'm speaking about 
the Catholic system. We're not speaking about Hindus. I'm speaking about Hinduism. Okay? Benji was telling, has told me that sometimes you'll go to a Hindu's house and the, their, their belief system allows for you to have as many gods as you like. I think there's 360 million gods, last count. And in some houses you will even see put up on the shelf a crucifix with Jesus on the cross. Just in case we haven't missed one out, you see. They're trying to blend in Jesus and they will even say, I do believe in Jesus. They may even say they believe a lot about things written about Jesus in the Bible. But they're trying to blend in. The system allows for a blending in of no matter what belief system it is and God will supposedly, whoever that is, will smile upon you. It doesn't work. You cannot do that. God will not accept it. To be a true believer and accepted by God and Jesus Christ, you know what it means? It means absolutely total replacement. The whole system that you may feel comfortable with and have been taught, it has to go. Right? That's why I get a little bit alarmed when people say, oh, they're Christians and they are still carrying on and they feel comfortable in a religious system that I, that I see and is totally opposed to the Word of God. I get uneasy with that. I, just, I, can't, see the, I can't just see the, how that can be compatible, how it works. Well, I know it doesn't work. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, John 4, 6. Acts 4, 4, 12. There's no salvation in any other name but the name of the Lord Jesus. Christianity is not compatible with Judaism and it's also not compatible with false forms of Christianity to say nothing of all the religions that are non-Christian. Tragedy will result, folks. Tragedy will result if you are trusting in a patched up, blended form of Christianity. The Christian gospel is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the only way of salvation, by faith in him through grace alone. And you know what? If you're holding on to anything else than that, it'll take you to hell. It'll take you to hell. And sad to say, the reality of heaven, the reality of heaven will only ever be for you a missed opportunity. And that's when it's serious. So I trust these little story, this little story that Jesus tells will have spoken to us each one that we may know as believers that we're to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Shall we pray? Father, we do give thanks for who you are and the wonderful truth of the gospel. Well, Father, your word is so clear. And it is true, we're not better than anyone else. We're sinners saved by grace and we acknowledge your good hand upon us in that. Help us to see this truth and help us to be those who are rejoicing in heart and spirit and mind so that our families, our neighbours, our friends will see that we truly belong to the Lord. Help us in this, we pray. and We just give thanks for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen.